Good morning. Welcome back to the Why in the Morning show. This is the Y254 channel. My name is Joy Mochache. You can find me on Joy underscore Mochache only on Twitter. But when you want to interact with this channel, when you want to talk to us, when you want to ask questions about this health show, you can do so on Facebook and Twitter. That is Y254 channel. On Instagram, you can find us on Y254 underscore channel. Do remember that you can watch us. I repeat, at 2 p.m. That is on channel DSTV 376. And today we're discussing a very important topic on health on Monday and actually uh I forgot to mention, if you do want to discuss with us, remember it's hashtag health on Monday and hashtag why in the morning. And let me introduce our guest. We're discussing a very important topic today, HIV slash AIDS. And we've been hearing the word being thrown around. But today we have a specialist. He's actually in the infectious diseases control sector. So if there's someone who knows everything about this, it is a man that we have on set today. Allow me to introduce Dr. Leon Ogoti. Karibu sana. Yes, Karibu Dr. Ogoti. So my name is Leon Ogoti. Yes. Yeah, I work in infectious disease. Infectious and disease. And I have also trained in infectious disease. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What do people in infectious disease do exactly, just briefly? Uh, people in infectious disease, um, I think the most interesting part is when you see Ebola in Congo and all these people running around. Those are infectious disease people. Okay. But generally, infectious disease people treat every kind of disease that is contagious that means that can be passed from me to you right. so anything think of the flu think of uh, malaria think of uh, hiv think of tb anything, anything any infection that's caused by something from outside to in, in that goes into your body right yeah that's right. what infectious disease is, is so that's yeah. what you focus on a day-to-day -day basis yes. okay mm -hmm. and today we're discussing in particular hiv yeah. aids mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, we are on a youth channel. This is Y254. Mm -hmm. And, you know, most of the time uh, we'd like to angle our discussion into something our youth can understand. Okay. So let's just jump right in. Let's start, first of all, by maybe letting our youth know, maybe those who don't know, when it comes to HIV AIDS, mm -hmm. what is this virus exactly, very briefly? And what does it mean for somebody who may carry it? Okay. So <sighs> HIV, as you said, is a virus. Um, and having HIV means you've been infected by the virus. That's it, it doesn't mean anything else. It doesn't mean you're sick, it just means you have the virus inside your body. Right. Um, HIV has proven to be very difficult because of the rate at which it multiplies. It multiplies very fast. Okay. Yeah, so it produces many, many copies in a very short period of time wow. after the virus, the primary virus gets into your body. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, Viruses are generally difficult to treat mm -hmm. or is, let's say impossible. There are usually no cures for viral infections. Uh -huh. Most of them, it's very hard to cure them. Yes. Yes, so you have a virus that multiplies very fast, yes. kills your cells, yeah. and kills the cells that contribute to your immunity. Mm. So you have a virus that multiplies very fast, is difficult or currently impossible to treat, and it kills off your immunity. So now you become susceptible to any other infection. So you have this infection that has made your immune system so weak that now you can get any other infectious disease. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So your chances are a lot higher. So that's what HIV is, right. and that's what it does, and that's why it's such a big problem. Okay. Yeah. And before we go very far in the conversation, maybe I can point out that even though people may have HIV or yeah. AIDS, that they are able to live a normal life through medication and antiviral medication and all those things and counseling even. And I hear actually that uh, wonderfully and very fortunately that there's even um, online websites that have come up to match HIV couples together. So there is there is hope when it comes to that. But moving right along, um, maybe we can touch on a different issue. Because for us, we'd like to focus on statistics. Okay. When it comes to youth, where we hear that the people who do carry the HIV virus, amongst all of them, the percentage who do carry the highest of it are the young people. Maybe aged from the age of uh, 15 up until 35. Yeah. Yes. Could you maybe speak a, a bit about this and maybe focus on Kenya as a whole or Africa? Okay. So in Kenya, we have about 1.5 million people infected with HIV. Sorry, 1.5? About 1.5 million people infected with HIV. And as you said, uh, the biggest chunk should be the youth. Actually, the 
cohort that's considered most important is 15 to 24. 15 to 24? Yeah. Wow. That's because, why is that? Because that's when people are oriented into sex. Right. And uh, you see at the age of 15, there's a lot of ignorance around sex at that time. Right. So you're more likely to do things that you'd not want to do or to be forced into sex and get infected subsequently. So it's because this is a very vulnerable age group. Right. And people are transitioning from childhood into adulthood. And there's a lot of confusion at that time. So they can be confused with money, they can be tricked, mm. you know, so many things that are contributing to people getting HIV at that time, mm. as compared to older people who make decisions. Okay, we assume they make logical decisions. <laughs> we assume they make logical <laughs> it's, decisions. It's not necessarily true, mm. but there are better places to make decisions around that. So, yes, so we, ha we do have a big chunk of uh, the youth infected, but the biggest problem we have in Africa is data. We don't have a lot of data. We don't do enough studies. We don't have enough information. Mm. And now we also have a lot of um, undiagnosed patients. So a lot of people are walking around with undiagnosed. Okay. So we have a lot of people walking around with HIV, but they don't know. And wow. our surveillance, surveillance is actively seeking cases, uh -huh. may not be the best. Mm. because we mostly rely on hospital surveillance, which is you come to the hospital, then maybe we test you. Right. But if you don't fall sick, then how? no one will ever know. We don't do much community outreaches to go and test. Right. Yeah. And self-testing kits have just been introduced. But we, are not, we can't really say that we know how many people have HIV. We estimates can be given, but they're also given by outsiders. But in ourselves, mm. we haven't done enough studies, we don't do enough outreach to actually identify all the cases that we have. Mm. Yeah. And before we move into how yeah. the youth may contract the virus, yeah. maybe we can touch on something that you have said. A mm. lot of people are walking around with this and it's not diagnosed. They're yeah. walking around with HIV, maybe it's even become AIDS at some point, and they're mm. walking around, they have no idea. It's not been diagnosed, they've not gone for testing. Yeah. Might you have any idea why as a doctor? Um, it's because unlike um, most other infections, the incubation period can be a long time. What is can the incubation be years. period? The period between when you get infected and when you start seeing your symptoms. Right. So it can be a very, very long time. Years. Okay. So you see unlike the flu, where if I come into contact with you and you sneeze in my face and I pick up the virus, in three, four days I'll be sneezing, I'll have a sore throat, but now you see, if you're talking about a disease that takes years, that means I get infected today. Yeah. There is nothing to show me that I'm sick. And because I am not thinking that I might be sick, I won't go and test. Mm -hmm. And because there's also a lot of stigma, people are even more afraid to test than if... <laughs> if yes. You know, people are now more afraid to test for HIV because they're afraid they might right. have it. They might have it. Yeah, so because it takes such a long time for you to have any kind of symptoms, mm -hmm. it might take, it, it takes different durations, but it can take a long time. Mm -hmm. So that makes it very difficult because if you're not exhibiting symptoms, then how do you know that you, you're sick? Mm -hmm. You have to take the initiative of going to the hospital and um, asking for the test to be done so that you can know. Now, many people are not willing to do that. That means they wait until they get sick mm. or they wait until a partner gets sick then tells them, hey, I've been found with this, you might want to go and get tested. Wow. Yeah, so that's how we end up having so people who are out there and they're very normal, very healthy, they look very normal. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I am, uh, you've brought up something very interesting and I think we'll touch very at the very end when okay. you can be thinking about it. Um, maybe we'll touch on why some countries have decided to put a death penalty on somebody who does not disclose the fact that they have HIV. But that we shall leave for the end. Now we need to go forward and talk about exactly why our youth, because they don't know that they have it, yeah. which means there are ways that they're contracting it and maybe they know they're getting it or they don't know they're yeah. getting it. Yes. Um, can we talk about the ways our youth are contracting HIV AIDS? Because, yes, there's the normal intercourse way, but I believe that there are more um, avenues our youths are able, unfortunately, to contract this virus. Okay. So, um, so 
HIV transmission is mainly, uh, it is transmitted through body fluids. So when you say body fluids, you're talking about um, blood, you're talking about semen, you're talking about vaginal fluids, anal fluids, you're talking about breast milk. So mainly those five. Yeah. So because we're not here to talk about mother to child transmission, we're going to talk about the youth. Yes. And um, as you see, I said blood, vaginal, anal, and semen. Yes. So three out of those four not are saliva. Not saliva. Okay. Three out of those four are sex related. Yes. One is um, blood, and now blood uh, we look at mostly people who use uh, injectable drugs, and people who use injectable drugs tend to share needles because they're expensive. The drugs are expensive, mm. but then you want to burden them with the cost of buying a new syringe mm -hmm. each time they want mm -hmm. to shoot up. Maybe, I don't know how many times they shoot up, three or four times a day. Yes. And uh, you want them to buy a different syringe each time. They They'd can. rather spend the money on the drugs. So they share needles. Most junkies are sharing needles. And sharing needles, blood is contaminated, so you end up having HIV and also other um, blood-borne diseases, you could have hepatitis being transmitted right. in the same form. Mm -hmm. So when we're looking at transmission, it's either drug users who are sharing needles, that's the main one way, and sex. So for sex, is heterosexual sex and homosexual, homosexual sex. So for heterosexual sex, it's, I mean, it's pretty much the same as it's always been. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that uh, I think of late we are we're seeing a lot more. It's become very mainstream. Sex is being is very mainstream on uh, media. It's like nowadays. kawaida. Yes, it's become very kawaida. Even the kind of songs people are singing about, the things that are being shown. So sex is has become very mainstream. Heterosexual sex, but in the background you also have men who have sex with men, and that's contributing a lot to HIV cases. In the West, like in the States, we have majority of the men who are getting infected with HIV are having sex with other men. Oh, in the U.S., majority of in men US. who are infecting other people are homosexuals. Yeah, are homosexual. Right. Not necessarily homosexuals. I, I, I don't know if they are or they are not, <laughs> because right. they might be having homosexual and heterosexual yes, sex. Yes, and we don't want but, to stop them. Yeah, but at least they're having sex with men. So that's a major way of contracting. The... Um, risk of contracting HIV if you have m among men who have sex with men is higher, much higher than men, I mean he regular heterosexual sex. So it's an increase, the higher chance of getting um, HIV through that uh, form. So it's basically about just if we look at how changes that have been made, the changes that are happening in sex. Yeah, so it's become very rampant, it's a lot more reckless. I don't know if people are having threesomes and orgies, all these things. I recently I learned and I was so surprised and I swear I would pinch my children if, if I had children <laughs> when I get them. I am learning that the things like sex parties, parties solely dedicated for intercourse of all kinds. And I'm thinking to myself, really, how are you going to walk out of there without an infection? Yeah. How? Yeah. You're definitely walking out with an infection of some sort. But uh, back to the conversation at hand, maybe we can uh, touch on what our country is trying to do. Because I feel like we've exhausted our measures. If we have advocated, we have advocated. If we have gone online, we have gone online. Yeah. If we have advertised and held up placards, if we have marched to the streets, we have done everything we can to express and to show the problem that there is in HIV AIDS and the spread. But still, it continues to spread. And not even that, it's even rising. Yeah. yeah, it's like getting worse. And not only that, it's getting worse amongst our youth. What are we doing wrong? What, what do you think we're doing wrong as, as an expert when it comes to infectious yeah. disease control? So, um, it's true that the incidence of HIV is rising. I think in a study, a global study done in 2015, yeah. by international health metric evaluation showed that cases of HIV are, the new cases of HIV have actually increased. Mm. Okay, they're measured in, as a decrease. Mm -hmm. So it's, if it's, de it's decreasing by 2% every year, then this year it decreases by 1%. We can see that there are more people who are getting HIV, right? So 
and Kenya was one of the countries. So there are 74 countries that were listed as having increasing cases of HIV, and Kenya was one of the 74. When you say we've exhausted um, our measures, we haven't because the measures that are in place, it's not that they are not working. Because you see, for example, if I give you drug X to treat disease A, then you take it and you don't get better, then you say it's not working. But if you take it and you get better, then you, someone else doesn't take it and doesn't get better. You, you don't say it's not working. You find ways to improve, because these measures work. And if they were used 100%, they work. They actually do work. Abstinence works. Mm -hmm. Abstinence does work. Abstinence does work. It does work. Wow. <laughs> so that's the one measure we've not exhausted. We've not exhausted that. Yes. People can abstain. It People works. can abstain. Yes. Yeah, because, because even if you walk into workplaces, work areas, in the toilets, everywhere, there are condoms everywhere. Yeah. Yes. But that's the one thing. Abstinence is the one thing we've not tried to push for. And once, I think when you speak it, you either look like a religious <laughs> fanatic, fanatic or something. Yeah, but it works. It's, I mean, uh, I don't know how, what people's perceptions of abstinence are, but if you can abstain, abstain mm -hmm. at least for yeah. people who are under the age of eating, because we are talking about 15 to 24 year olds. So at least before you feel like you're at the age where you can make logical decisions, sensible decisions, or able to live with the consequences of your decisions, you can abstain. That's the best option. Okay. We are talking about, uh, because we still work with ABC, the government has already spoken about ABC, mm -hmm. abstinence, be faithful, and use condoms. Mm -hmm. People can be faithful. It works. It's a strategy that works. If the man and the woman in a marriage are both faithful, mm -hmm. then where is the HIV going to come from if they're not Nowhere. using it? It doesn't come into the picture. Yes. But if you're not faithful or you, you're not abstaining, that's fine. Then if you're in a relationship, you're not abstaining, that's fine. But if you're not being faithful, then now you've complicated the matter. Mm. Because we always know that you're not faithful, whoever you're not faithful with is not faithful. And I mean, it's a long, long chain of a lot of unfaithful people. But at some point, if HIV comes into the picture, it comes into the picture, the whole picture. Okay. So we have kind of, you know, come to the conclusion that abstinence, I think, is the best thing. Yeah. And being faithful and, yeah. you know, using contraceptives and condoms. So I feel as if maybe we can move on to that one question I said that we're going to touch on. We're leaving Kenya now. We're going yeah. overseas. There are measures that people are taking overseas to curb HIV AIDS. Since we have talked about the measures we've taken here in Kenya and what we have done and how it's going, uh, maybe we can talk about how do you feel as a doctor when it comes to the countries where, for example, if you, or if somebody um, engages in intercourse mm -hmm. and they have HIV and they don't tell that person that they have HIV, that person can take that person to court on charges of murder because essentially you're killing them. And essentially you are taking and they will die at some point. Yeah. And I hear that, um, yeah, this does come because people are taking it seriously. Like if you don't tell me I'm taking you to court and if I do find out that you had it, I will Engineer. <laughs> make sure you get a life with a death penalty or something. How do you feel about this? And do you think that it's too extreme or do you think it's a measure we can take here in Africa? Uh, I, yes, what you've said is true. It is, technically it is reckless endangerment because you're putting someone at risk of something and you're aware, you see, if you don't know, then it's different. Yes. But if you know, then you're intentionally infecting someone. Yes. Whether you intend to do it or not, if you do it, then you are intentionally putting them at risk. So in that case, you could look at it like that. Um, I really don't have an opinion on uh, what should happen under the law. Uh -huh. And I don't know what happens because, I mean, you know, there's really no way of saying I knew mm -hmm. unless maybe now they're taking drugs, but most people don't even know. So I think I would leave that up in the air. I mean, if you would it not could like be, to give an opinion, if yeah, I wouldn't like to give an opinion. But if the people who make laws find because it is a big problem it and is. it's costing the government a lot of money. 
right. and it's costing uh, and the, we're also losing a lot of economic output from people being sick. But don't you think for such an extreme problem that maybe extreme measures, measures should be required. put? Yes, if you're an extreme. Thank you for answering <laughs> the question. <laughs> You're okay, putting you on the go. spot, but fine. <laughs> <laughs> you were saying? Yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, if uh, lawmakers choose to go that way, then maybe, maybe, yeah, because we also have uh, a similar problem with a disease like TB, mm -hmm. where people who are sick, and you know TB is very easy to transmit because we are sitting in a matter to I have TB. Mm. When we leave, I've trans given it to all of you, so it just depends on whether you get <sighs> sick or not. And you have this person not taking their medication. So you see then that means they're putting other people at risk and they're doing it intentionally. Because they might not want you to get sick, mm. but the fact that I'm not taking my drugs means you're going to get sick if mm. I stay around you long mm. enough. That's a problem. That is a problem. Yeah, so maybe tougher measures are required. I, I don't know right, how right. that would be done. Okay. Yeah, well, I won't give a direct answer, but I'll say for, you know, for extreme cases, let's have extreme measures. <laughs> and we need to conclude our segment. I'd like for us to now talk about um, when it comes to our young people and stigma. Because lastly, the thing that bothers people the most is if I have HIV, first of all, I can't tell anybody and it's embarrassing. Yeah. Like even going to get medication is a problem. Not even that, um, just going for testing is an issue. Maybe you can try and tell our youth uh, through the words of an expert of infectious disease control and through being the experience of a doctor, yeah. how you could assist our youth in maybe taking this as a serious problem do get tested every six months, especially if, you're, if you know you're sexually active. Make sure you're getting tested a couple times a year, not just once a year. And yes, I'd like for you to give those details through on how someone can carry the measures through. Because at the end of the day, we're not going to stop our young people from having sex. We can't do that. Mm -hmm. But we need to give measures on how they can protect themselves. Okay. Yeah. So in HIV care and treatment, we, there's something called the 90-90-90 rule. So the 390s. So the UNAIDS and the WHO and the CDC trying to have 90% of people diagnosed, 90% of people with HIV diagnosed, and 90% of the people who are diagnosed on treatment, 90% of those on treatment having their viral load suppressed which means it's so low that it won't have an effect on your immunity, so you'll live very normally. And secondly, you will chances of you transmitting it to anyone else are very slim, because if you're working with numbers of the virus being transmitted, they are so low in your system that you can't even pass it to anyone else. So there's that, but you see the first 90 years test. Right. So that's the biggest problem that we have, because people are not testing. When you speak about stigma, it's the biggest reason why people are not testing. Uh -huh. Because when I go test, mm. first of all, mm. what is your opinion? What is the, how does a person who's testing me look, look at me? Yeah. That's what I think. Mm. Though the people are trained and they're counselors and they've seen a lot of these cases and they take it just as a, any other disease. Mm -hmm. But what is their perception that you think they have of you once you test and you're positive? It's a problem. And once you're positive, what do you do? Who do you tell? You can tell anyone. You feel isolated, so I find that even where I work, uh, people will come from very far to come and pick their drugs from there because they don't want people at their workplace where they live to know, so they go very far wow. to be seen somewhere else where nobody knows them. Yeah, even the pharmacist doesn't know them. Yeah, nobody knows them. Yeah. The community doesn't know them. So, this, so stigma is a very big problem. It's stopping people from getting from, from getting tested. Now, if we can't test, then we can't treat. So if we can't treat, then we, more of us are getting sick. So the f most important thing is we need to end the stigma, we need to end the discrimination, because someone who has HIV, has the infection, and doesn't have AIDS, and is on treatment, is it's just like anyone else. I mean, they're a very normal member of society. They do everything very well. Yes. Yeah. They can live for, and they live for a very long time. Mm. So we shouldn't really discriminate against these people. We should be encouraging each other because the more people get tested and treated, the less likely I am to get it because I don't have anyone to collect it from. 
Okay. So then... And lastly and final, this is the last question because you've okay. mentioned something. Um, we do need to wind up uh, because youth and politics will be coming through. Okay. Uh, I've heard a quote, if, very briefly if you can say that if you don't have HIV, you're not in fashion or even worse, ah, HIV is just a disease like any other. Katu homa. My God. As much as you can live a normal life, yeah. can you explain the difference between living a normal life and carrying this? <laughs> in, so, one, in actual in conclusion so that we can close the show down. Okay. So the difference is the diseases that if you contract, they can recover or you get better after a while. Or their impact on your body is not so severe. But with HIV, if you get HIV and you don't you don't get tested and you don't start your treatment. You only live normally if you're on treatment. If you don't start your treatment, it knocks out <coughs> your immunity completely. So you have almost no immune cells, so you will get many other infections and it will take you down. So that's the difference between so many other diseases and HIV. So yes, if you're on treatment, you'll be okay. But if you're not, hmm. you will not be okay. Right. There is no chance. And the only way you can be on treatment is by getting tested. tested. And so, yes, please, anyone out there, if you know that you're having a sexually active life, Tafadali, do get tested several times a year. And hey, I forget about the stigma, even if it means going far away, like doctor said, unfortunately, this thing has to be done. Do get tested so you can get treated, so you can save your own life. Thank you so much for tuning in. It has been wonderful. Asante Sana for coming to the show, Dr. Leon Ogoti. Thank you for having me. Uh -huh. It has been Health on Monday. It is hashtag Health on Monday, hashtag Why in the Morning. My name is Joe Mochache. can be found on Joy underscore Mochache on Twitter alone. Thank you so much for tuning in. Coming up next is Youth in Politics.